Grace and peace to you, MSPC community. It's good to be with you again this week as we join together in worship. You know, it's been playing on me uh, this week that this is a really unique time. It's probably the first time ever that we have been asked in order to save the world to stay home and watch TV. So we can do this, right? We can beat this thing. So I hope that you have donned your super cape and you have your cup of coffee in hand as we worship together. I have a few important reminders for you. This week, we sent out word that our church building is closed, and this is really to keep to a minimum those who are in and out of our building. That's for cleaning purposes, but also to honor that stay-at-home order. But we will have someone answering the phone during our regular office hours. That's Monday through Thursday, 9 to 2. So if you have a question, feel free to call in, feel free to email, uh, and someone will be here to answer those questions or pick up the phone. If you find that you need to access the church building, we just simply ask that you give us a call before you come. And that way we can troubleshoot whether you really need to be here at the church or if we can get things to you in order for you to do your ministry. So we want you to know that and be aware of that. We also wanted to let you know that we have started through uh, some prayer and reflection, a midweek devotion and prayer service. You know, uh, this is really coming out of this sense that we want to still be relational with one another. Many of the small groups are using Zoom, that video conference tool, and they're able to pray and to study in real time with one another. And we just wanted to add one more thing in the mix to bring this community together in prayer for the world and for our loved ones. So this is happening Wednesday at noon, and all you need to do is click on a link that is in that email that we are sending out, our church emails. Uh, Pat Dunn, Richard Nordgren are leading the charge on this. We had a few folks with us this first week we got started, so we encourage any and all who are able to pause Wednesdays at noon for prayer. We also wanted to share with you an update on our collections for the food bank and for Elijah Family Homes. We had asked you to bring in some items that were listed in the email. And we did get a delivery out to the food bank. We got a delivery out to Elijah Family Homes this week. But in light of the stay-at-home order, here's how we're doing this. When you're out at the store, and if you feel led and are able, still pick up those items, but keep them at home for now. And when the time is right and we're able to come back into the building, we'll start collecting them from you then. I believe there will still be a need for them, even uh, in the weeks to come, even if we pause for now. So be keeping that in mind. And continue to be faithful in your giving, in your regular giving for the work of the church and this community. Also be thinking about above and beyond giving, if you have the means to do that. Our Deacon Benevolence Fund, uh, there are many requests before it in this time. I'm sure many more will come. And so we want to make sure that that is vital and healthy. We are also doing a special offering for the season of Lent. One great hour of sharing. Now our children are already doing this. They've got their fish banks. They're working through their calendars and activities day by day for that collection. But if this offering, one great hour of sharing, is close to your heart, you can still give to it. This is an offering of the wider church, the Presbyterian Church USA, that goes toward hunger and disaster and development ministries that we do every Lent, every season of Lent. Of course, this Lent has been unique. It's been different. But if you want to give to this uh, particular offering, write a check, and in the memo line, write one great hour of sharing and drop it in the mail, and we will collect all that and send it on to the PCUSA. Friends, now's the time. Let us join our hearts together as we worship our God.
I invite us now to spend some time in prayer, in our community prayer. And uh, during that prayer time, I'm going to be lifting up some particular requests that came to me this week. If you want to have a prayer request shared church-wide uh, in this time, just send me an email. But before we begin, I, I do have a, a news and a note for our congregation in particular uh, to share with you. Many of you know Fred has been on hospice care these many weeks, and we got word that on Friday he took a turn for the worse. And I received uh, uh, word from his daughters this morning, on Saturday morning, that uh, Fred had died. And so our hearts and our prayers go out to Linda, to Cheryl, Fred's daughters, as they mourn his loss. But we know, too, that Fred is now in the hands of God, fully and freely. He is healed and he is whole. And we give thanks to God for that. While right now no services are able to be held, the family are planning to set a later date and time when friends and family can gather together to honor Fred's life and his faith. So we'll get you information out as soon as we know more. Let us pray. God, we are so thankful in this time that we can go to you in prayer, that prayer is an avenue to talk with you, to be close to you, to lift any need before you that is happening, and there are many needs right now. God, we pray to start for our wider community. We pray for our world and for the many nations that are struggling and dealing with the virus who are using their best resources, putting their best people in positions to effectively combat the virus. We know that this is unprecedented, and so we ask that you would give them good wisdom in how they lead their countries. God, we pray for this community, too, for uh, the ways in which you are being uh, evident even here and now in our situation. We pray this week for our Northwest Coast Presbytery family of churches because we are aware that many in congregations, especially on the West Side, have members who are identified as those who have the virus. And so we put them before you, God. We pray for, their, uh, for your presence near and dear to them in this time and for those churches that are rallying around them. God, I, I, I bear a special burden this week, too, for those who struggle in mental health. And I pray that even in this time when they are isolated and they are cut off from those professional and relational resources, that you would be steadfast with them, that you would give them perseverance, that you would give them a word and a feeling of hope, God, and that that assurance would help them understand that there is another side to this and that they will get through it. God, I lift up to you these particular requests as well for our MSPC community. We pray with Jim and Miriam for their granddaughter Katie who has virus-like symptoms. We pray with Barbara P who has several requests for her friend in Seattle with a virus, for her daughter's roommate who is battling cancer and struggling to get the therapy that she needs. And we pray with Barbara P. for her granddaughter, who is working drive through food service, that you would keep her well. And of course, God, we lift up the family of Fred for uh, their mourning. We pray for, their, um, for you to be near to them, for you to be evident and comforting them in this time. For you to give them, Lord, uh, good memories of Fred and the comfort that he is with you now. Lord, we thank you for how your spirit guides our hearts and we pray for your spirit to be guiding our thinking in ways that push against any negativity at this time, that really work toward being, Lord, uh, part of the solution to being calm and at ease, to being assured that you are with us even here and now. 
Though we know that you do not guarantee we will not struggle in this life, you do promise us, God, that you will be with us every step of the way. And we hold to that promise here and now. We hold to the words that your son Jesus Christ taught us. We pray that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This week we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4 for our scripture reading. I invite you to join with me in the reading. Let us listen to God's word. The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. For everything God created is good and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving because it is consecrated by the word of God and prayer. If you point these things out to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. That is why we labor and strive, because we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and especially of those who believe. So command and teach these things. And don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Friends, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The fact that our stay-at-home situation and this church season of Lent are playing out simultaneously is interesting to me. I've been thinking about this all week. You know, in our current restrictions, we've been asked to stay home, to stay healthy. We've been asked to keep our lives and our routines to the basic necessities, to tuck in, so to speak. And life has a way of bringing us to these seasons of restrictions every now and then. Sometimes these seasons come about by choice, and at other times they come about by circumstance, and that's our situation now. In Lent, we are asked to come to the basic necessities of our faith, to peel away the layers of complication that life has added, maybe by giving something up or maybe by taking something on. You know, I wonder if these two things, these restrictions and Lent, are really two peas in a pod, given our new reality. This week, we continue to talk about longing, and in particular to us as believers, how to direct our longing in a way that pleases God. Today's topic is about longing for the Word, God's Word in particular. We're talking about the importance and the value of studying the Bible. Now in our passage that we read today, we get the sense right from the start that there's a problem that's being addressed. Paul's writing this letter to one of his protégés, to Timothy, who is leading the church in Ephesus. 
And like in many churches of that time, disagreements about both fundamental and practical matters arose. At points, what the Bible calls false teaching arose. And this was teaching that went against agreed upon understandings of the Christian faith, false teaching. To give it context, because it's timely, you know, we can think of false teaching in the terms of fake news. Fake news is news that we hear or read about that may seem like the real article. Maybe it's even based in fact, but it often includes information, maybe even outright lies, in order to promote an agenda. And that agenda may be panic, it may be fear. I think you get the idea. Fake news is a real problem right now. You know, there's so much information that's coming at us, so much chatter on social media. And every day, I don't know about you, but every day it feels like I am drinking from a fire hose. Now more than ever, we have to be careful not just about what we read, but where we read it from. Now more than ever, we have to go to credible sources to know the truth of our situation. It's so important today. And in Timothy's time, what we're reading about is that there are teachers who are, are offering these practices, actually laying them down as law. Things like abstaining from marriage or certain foods. They're saying that these, these rules are necessary for believers. These practices, though, aren't God's teaching. They're not based on God's teaching. The problem is, too, that rather than being correctable, these people are pushing their agenda. Paul says their consciences had been seared as with a hot iron. And what that means is that they have no sense of their wrongness, of what they're promoting. They've become desensitized to the truth. That hot iron has cauterized that sensitivity to the truth. Now, we might wonder what the big deal is here. It kind of seems like a small matter in light of the grand scheme of things. But for Paul, these particular practices go against a fundamental truth about God, that God is a good creator. We learned this right in the very beginning in Genesis, where God created all things, and after he lists everything that is created, he says he calls it good. Right? Animals, plants, us. So what this means that is that if God is good and God is the creator, then everything God created is good. It means that the food that we eat and the relationships that we have are good gifts from a loving God. That God wants the best for us in this life as much as the life to come. And so the wrong of this false teaching is that it puts all of the eggs in the basket of life to come. And it rejects anything that smacks of the life here and now. Put simply, the teaching doesn't stack up to what Paul and Timothy know about God from Scripture. So what should Timothy, who is on the ground there in Ephesus, do about all this? Paul gives him this counsel. He says, rather than go toe-to-toe or point-by-point point with these guys... Paul says, point out the truth. Simple as that. So Timothy is to offer a positive answer then to any negative teaching that's put out there to the universe. When these people say don't marry or don't eat such and such, Timothy is to remind the brothers and the sisters who are listening why God gave us marriage and why God gave us good things to eat. Now, Paul, Paul takes a bolder approach against false teaching in other letters, in other books of the Bible. But I see this approach here as Paul telling Timothy, stay cool, know that you don't have anything to prove, the truth will set them free. Stay cool, I think Paul is saying here. So while this isn't confrontational, this counsel, though, still does require some guts and a lot of perseverance on Timothy's part. That's why Paul's counsel moves to plain speaking and strong encouragement to Timothy in particular, so that Timothy can get through all of this with his integrity intact. 
You know, have you ever been faced with such a situation? Maybe you're trying to convince someone of the error of their ways and you realize quickly that they're just not getting that and they're not listening. Now, we have options in these situations, right? We can lay down the law and we can, we can do so in a hard way, right? But sometimes the wise course, the way of integrity, is simply to take a step back and with humble confidence to tell them your truth. I think that's what's going on here in Paul's word to Timothy. And so the second half of this passage is really a personal address to Timothy. Paul tells him, first off, be nourished on the truths of the faith and the good teaching that you have followed. Being nourished is to take in or to spend time on whatever promotes growth and health, spiritually speaking. And for Paul, the things that promote promote growth and health are the truths of the faith. You know, I've been talking a lot with our confirmation crew about this very thing. We've been learning about the Apostles' Creed and how this was a teaching tool of the early church, how it pulled together all of their learnings from God's word so that everyone was on the same page in knowing who God was, who Jesus was, and other matters of faith. If, Paul says, Timothy dwells on such things, he'll do all right. And if he dwells on such things, then the study of those things will make their way into his actions, the practice of them, on a day-to-day basis as he leads the church there in Ephesus. That good teaching. But to have such sustained attention Timothy is going to need to train up. Now, Paul uses this image of physical training. He's used it in other letters before, uh, but here he uses it for a particular purpose. And he says that this physical training, and that's conditioning, right? Conditioning that athletes do to get to that top peak form and performance. He says that this kind of training has some benefits, right? Fitness, maybe mental acuity, I'm sure growth and health are in the mix there too. But even better than being physically fit, Paul says, is being spiritually fit. And that kind of fitness takes training too. What this kind of spiritual fitness involves, first, according to Paul, first, putting aside all distractions. For Timothy, that's going to be what Paul calls those distractions are godless myths, and old wives' tales. So Timothy's going to have to work hard not to give in to that false teaching. He's going to have to work hard to stand firm in the word of God and God's truths. Because in the end, God's word will prove all this chatter to be bankrupt religion and silly superstition. In another letter to Timothy, Paul talks about such chatter and its effect, and he says there's going to come a time when people will have no desire, no longing for the truth, but with itching ears, with an unhealthy curiosity, they'll follow only what satisfies their wants and desires. You know, think about this for us. It's easy for us, isn't it, to get caught up in conversation or caught up in news that hooks our emotions, that's solely intended to give us permission to satisfy those unhealthy wants or desires. It's easy for us to do this. In this situation, Timothy is to keep his head, and what Paul is talking about here is to stay focused on the truth at hand. To stay focused on the truth at hand, not get hooked by those mis- and old wives' tales. So spiritual fitness involves putting aside those distractions, and spiritual fitness also involves keeping an eye on the goal. That's for Timothy, that's for us too. So Timothy is to train not just for the here and now, but also for the then and there. He's to train knowing that godliness has value for both the present life and the life to come. You know, if all of our effort in this life 
is bent on one purpose. And maybe that's to achieve that promotion. Maybe it's to buy that bigger house. Maybe it's to build that better life. Then we have our reward. Jesus talks about this a lot in the Gospels. We will have our reward if all we work for is the things of this life. But as the saying goes, we can't take it with us. And so spiritual fitness, godliness, is a thing that helps us stay grounded in God in this life and stay with God in the life to come. Spiritual fitness helps us to see into and be strong and steadfast in the deeper things, the deeper purposes for why we are here and what we are about. Spiritual fitness finally depends upon a faith that is grounded in God's word. It comes back to God's word. You know, as a leader in the church, Timothy has a great responsibility, but I believe that these principles that Paul lays out is good for every believer. Timothy is to set an example as a leader in the church, but all of us in our faith and in our life are examples of Christian integrity to a watching world. And so it's so crucial that our faith is all of a piece, that what we say is what we do is who we are. And the key to this for Timothy, for all of us really, is that we long for God's word. And what that means is that we are to, first and foremost, read the Bible for all it's worth. Understand the great truths of the faith so that our faith is fully committed and not in name only. God's word is to saturate every inch of us so that the practice of it comes naturally. You know, I think of this a little bit in terms of family resemblance. Maybe I've shared this example with you before. We may look like our families, but we also tend to act like our families. Have you noticed this for yourself? Because we spend time with our families, we start to pick up on their mannerisms, right? Maybe I, I, I talk like my mom or I eat like my brothers and sisters. The same is true when we spend time with God and God's word. We tend to take take on the mannerisms of our Lord, and that's a good thing. Richard Foster wrote that the study of God's word is one of the central ways God uses to change us. What we study determines the kind of habits that are formed. And Philippians says as much. It says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think on such things. You know that saying, we are what we eat? Well, I think Paul's spin on this is, we are what we think. And what we think comes from what we immerse ourselves in. If we spend our time in fake news, if we spend our time in salacious and bankrupt consumption, then our hearts and minds will become accustomed to it. And that negativity will become our habit and it will shape the way we think. But if we spend our time reading the Bible in God's word, learning the great truths of the faith, then it will become a habit. And that habit will start to shape us in godly ways. So instead of longing for the things that are negative or that stir up, we will then long for the things that are good and life-giving. You know, the psalmist says that that habit will make us thrill to God's word. Our heart will sing for it, will yearn for it. And so we've got to choose carefully what we feed our hearts and minds. Will it be God's good and life-giving word, or will it be something else? The Bible says that the one who delights in God's word is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season. Its leaves never wither. Whatever they do prospers. You know, when I came to interview here at Meadows Springs and in the Tri-Cities two years ago, I remember asking about the trees that I saw as we were driving around. If any of them were native, I asked that question, are any of these trees native here? And someone on the PNC said, no. Paused for a moment and then said, well, you know, the ones along the riverbank are. 
even in the desert, life is wherever there is good nourishment. So many things demand our attention, our desires, but when we place that attention on God's word, we are going to be satisfied in immeasurable ways. God's word will never leave us bankrupt. It will always prove its promises to us. And I'm thankful to God for that. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for your word that gives us life, that gives us good against any negative or dark thought or evil thing. We thank you that that word can, can saturate us so much that our actions, our, our speech, our conduct all follow suit. And I pray that for me, I pray that for MSPC, I pray that for this community, I pray that for this world, that your word would go out and the promise you give, give that it will never return void, it will never return empty, or that we would see the evidence of that, especially in this time. We thank you, God, for this word today. Be with us in our faith and in our ministry and in how we serve. Amen.
as we sit tight, as we tuck in in these weeks. May we know the depth of God's love for us. May we allow that love to wash over us in ways that bring us confidence and assurance and hope. And I leave you with this blessing that comes from William Sloan Coffin that someone forwarded me this week. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God give you grace not to sell yourself short. Grace to risk something big for something good. Grace to remember that the world is too dangerous for anything but truth and too small for anything but love. May God take your minds and think through them. May God take your lips and speak through them. May God take your hands and work through them. May God take your hearts and set them on fire. Amen. Bye for now.